everyone, and welcome to Watches and Whiskey. Adrian, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Roman? I have a very important question to ask you. Yeah, what are we tell. drinking? <laughs> I was going to ask you the same thing. Uh, what are we drinking? We're ill-prepared today. How about this, uh, this single? Do we have any right? bourbon? Any bourbon on the shelf? All right, let's do some bourbon. You know what? i got to bring a few more bourbons here. I, gotta, I, I think i got to bring some from my house. Some bourbon? All right. A little High I West. Like, I like High West. I, their their product is absolutely insane. I have like at this point like twenty five different bottles of High West stuff at my house. My guy Nick. So you is, can share a few with me. Our, our guy Nick over there is salivating because he likes their stuff. Yeah. This is this is this stuff is still readily available on the shelf. The Prairie Bourbon, but some of their other stuff like EBKA and Midwinter Drem is like insane. Every time you say Midwinter Drem, I keep like thinking it's, you're going to say Midwinter Dream or but something. But they can't. It's a play on words because they're not allowed to use that name for obvious reasons. So yeah, cheers. cheers. Welcome back. We have something to celebrate, actually. We have uh, the fact that we launched uh, mm. Gray Market. I was going to mention, things are very busy in the office lately. I walk in and there's a camera right in my face as I walk in. You know, I mean, It's like 9 in the morning. I'm like, yo, can you just back up? For I a have, you know what? I'm having a tough time. Like I yeah, This morning, I woke up at like 5. I'm sitting there answering emails. I have to get, put myself in check. Am I at the office working? Or am I at the it's office crazy. making a show, right? Crazy. And, you know, it's not scripted. So Yeah, exactly. When when we discussed the idea in the beginning, I, you know I was against it because I'm like, well, listen, we're on... It's going to get in the way. We're right? on an, Well, get in the way, plus we're on an industrial boulevard in a complex God knows where. <laughs> we're not in L.A. or Miami or New York where we're doing we're, this, that, and third. But we're in South Yet Miami. there's so much that goes on here on a daily basis, drama. And unfortunately, they got it. They have to follow me more with the camera because I'm always the one cursing and, you're all, and, and no, you're, deals. According and, to my, uh, my Instagram fans, you're always the one that's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> no, but listen. At the end of the day, guys. Uh, so, believe it or not, this idea was born two years ago. Ivy came to me and he's like, "Listen, I love you. What's on my desk? I love the Q and A. I love the vlogs." Uh, and he's like, "Well, we got to do. Sorry, guys. We got to do." more of a behind the scenes. And I have an idea for the show called Gray Market. Remember, he even made the sizzler for it like two years ago. Well, not the one that's there now. My whole thought was, I'm already doing a little bit of it. Like when I go to the trade shows, when I go to yeah. travel, I mean, you go buying stuff. We already show some of that stuff, but he's saying show the daily because there's so much more that goes on behind running this company that it could be potentially be interesting. And I'll be honest with you right now, first episode, we are already at 64,000 views, right? Since it last aired on Monday, on what was it Thursday. I don't remember when we, when Tuesday we aired that one. We're going to start airing them on Monday. And that we, we aired the second one 20 hours ago, and it's already at 38,000 views. So, mm -hmm. so obviously, we're doing something right again. Nothing scripted, right, guys? We just let the cameras roll and uh, show you the day-to-day. -day. We're going to show you more information because we, there is an ultimate goal here. The concept behind the show was like, look, uh, you know, we're done with uh, putting you know, Richard Meals on Ferrari steering wheels, right, uh, and selfies with Bentleys and things of that nature. Yeah. We're kind of past that. We're not trying to make it. We already made it. And uh, we just want to sh give you guys a sneak peek of what it no, takes. No, we haven't made it yet. Well, yeah, we're, you never make it, right? Uh, it. We never, you never really make it. Uh, but uh, the, funny, the funniest part about it was um, <laughs> I think my dad was fresh to the idea. So when we were filming episode one, and uh, we hired a new camera guy, and he walked into my dad's office, and my dad was in the middle of a deal, and the camera was on my dad's face. My dad, if a look could kill, that look <laughs> kill. That, poor, that, poor, that, make a, that that kid actually didn't come back to work the next day. <laughs> he like dropped the camera and left. <laughs> he gave him the Russian mob look, and the kid was just like, uh -huh. uh, anyway. So guys, I hope you, for those of you that haven't watched it, check it out. Uh, for those of you that have, certainly comment, let us know your thoughts. This isn't one of those shows where we're going to be like, oh, make suggestions and we'll do this. And though this is real day, like yeah. day to day. And, uh, you know, there's only so much we can show you within an hour or under an hour or however long this show runs. Some episodes are going to be more exciting. You know, travel is opening back up, right? Yeah. I mean, in mine and Adrian's next trip, we're going to I Dubai. can't wait till we do Hong Kong. Again. Dubai, Amman, Hong Kong. Oh, I mean, all those places, you're going to see a lot of that. But there's plenty of excitement that goes on here on a daily basis. And in the very least, uh, we can... Maybe open up our books a little bit, show some numbers. What, what kind of money are we actually making? What are the profit margins? You know, what are our goals? Because we do have goals that we set here weekly, quarterly, and monthly. But this is Watches and Whiskey. This is in yes. Gray Market. And uh, I know that you're salivating to talk about this. F1 coming to yeah, the United although, States? Although at this point, kind of old news. But when I heard about F1 coming to the United... Well, it's already actually in Texas. They have a Texas Grand Prix. Right. But I believe they're replacing one of the races. Don't recall where and they're making it in Miami, which is like perfect. 
You know what I mean? There, there literally could not be a better venue in the world than bringing it to Miami. What time of year would that take place? Uh, so it's they're saying it's probably going to be 2022, second quarter. So probably somewhere else springtime, which is F1 season. Which is perfect because like, if, oh, you, if perfect. you do that in the summer, forget about it. It's so yeah. hot. It's just, I don't think it's, I yeah. mean, the humidity and everything else I mean, will affect. If you, if you want to talk about the elite of the elite coming for this event, Miami's going to be, Miami already today, like we talked about not being able to get a, a reservation anywhere weeks in advance. Now, when for F one weekend, oh my god! Well, it's, it's a good, crazy. It's, a, it's a good thing we have a place to stay in. And, where, where? But where, where is it going to take place? Do you know? Uh, so, from what I read so far, it's going to be taking place in Miami Gardens near Hard, Hard Rock Stadium in Miami. So a little bit off the beaten path. Obviously, it's not like well, Monaco you, you, in the you, middle you, of Miami. It's off. I would just say, imagine if, imagine if oh, they man. did that. In the, but it's tough though, because downtown yeah, yeah. downtown Miami is kind of square. Yeah, no. You have a lot of bridges there. Yeah, they can brickle the water. Do it. I mean, all the bridges and stuff. I mean, I, <laughs> the cars can fly into water. <laughs> it's probably not going to be. I can't even think of a. I mean, I can. I mean, you shut down Collins Avenue, forget about it. You can have traffic <laughs> traffic for sixteen weeks. Worse, I guess you're right. It, ha- it kind of has to be off the beaten path, and they're they're literally they're probably going to build some state of the art track, obviously, and just build a whole city. How long's the How long's the F one track? How long is F1 track? I'm not sure. I think each race is a little bit different, pending laps, pending size. I'm not sure. So 5.4 kilometers is one lap. Is one lap. Yeah. And the total race is how long? Um, each one varies. It's usually like 60 laps, 65 laps, something like that. So yeah, it was 65. 65 laps. 65 yeah. laps. Okay. Yeah. So. I mean, and time-wise, what does that take? Probably like an hour and a half. I think. Each race is an hour and a half. Probably. Yeah. I guess I think it also depends where you are, because like if when when. Now, I'm not familiar with F1 whatsoever yeah. like that. Well, I, I, I actually just became familiar with F1 recently when me and Jess sat, sat down to watch the show on Netflix. Like, I was always kind of intrigued is by Is that when you became a fan? <laughs> literally. Literally. Actually, I became a fan. Jess is, like, diehard. She actually watched it on TV. She's like, Max Verstappen got number two. Lewis <laughs> Hamilton got number one. Like, damn, babe. Like, she's she's super excited. And we watched it on Netflix and instantly fell in love with the whole process because until, until you watch that show, you don't really understand how it works and how unfair F1 is. You know, it reminds me a lot about baseball where there's no salary cap. You have the worst team, which is Team Haas, it's an American team, and their budget is like, you know, 10% of what Mercedes' budget is. So Mercedes has the best engineering, best coaching, best everything. That's why they're number one. And Haas is like scrambling for dollars, and they can't make it. Speaking of speaking of F1, uh, can we bring our F1 car in here? So while Nick is bringing that, I, didn't, I should have brought that to begin with. I didn't even think about it. While Nick is bringing that, choice. Barrichello or Montoya? Not watches. Drivers. Pick one. Oh, actually, how about this? I say one, two, three, and we go for the one that we pick. Ready? These are a little bit older. I'm not too familiar with them, but I'm just going to say one, two, three. Wait, wait, ready? One, two, three. Montoya. Yeah. (laughs) So, look, we agreed on something. You like that? Anyway, uh, listen, guys. And and that doesn't doesn't mean I like the Montoya watch better than the Barrichello, I think, just as the driver. More diversified and went into NASCAR, obviously. But, look. If you ask me to pick a watch today and literally just put my, you know, instant answer. Hey, give me an F1 watch. I would say either Montoya or Barrichello. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, this th- these are to commemorate the actual drivers. Exactly. But, like, when it comes to, when it comes to, like, if somebody literally said, you know, F1 driver watch, go. It would either be, for me, I'd probably say Montoya or Barrichello right away. That would be probably well, somebody, the first watch. Yeah, if somebody told me F1 watch, go, first brain, I think, but it was Audemars Piquet, hands down. I tend to think of Hublot, too. We'll get into that in a second. Let me see that card. So since we're talking F1, might as well show off a little yeah. toy we have. This came. You this, guys didn't think we were going to bring in an actual F1 card, did you? So tell I, me about this card. I believe this came, actually, if you can see the top here, I don't know if they can see on the other side. It says Romain. This was Romain Grosjean's Lotus. Right. That's what it is. That's why it says Lotus but, up here. But it's. But I think it was a team when he raced for Team Renault, um, Richard Meal. This came with, I believe, when I bought a... So McLaren Turb. Exactly. Not, I'm sorry, not McLaren. Lotus Turb. The Lotus Turb. Lotus Turb. This yeah. is what it came with. Uh, now, this th- now this thing is an exact replica of this car. Yeah. Let's not run the watches over. Hold on. Uh, well, actually, you know what? We can do this. Here we go. This, if this is an Instagram, if I have a shot, if I have a soul one, by the we way. need Richard Mille for that. Yeah, I know. But uh, cool. uh, this is an exact replica of that particular car. Everything is moving. Everything is working. Richard Mille doesn't get a whole lot of real estate on this, obviously. They're not really the main sponsor, but they're up here. I guess you guys can see that yep. Richard Mille right yeah. in the front, and right I guess and I, and uh, I guess the uh, well, who's the main sponsor here? I mean, I, uh, there's I mean, a lot of sponsors. I know, well, right. it's Team Renault, right? Obviously, that would be. But there, I mean, you got Microsoft places. Dynamics on here, which is a accounting oh. software. You got all kinds of stuff on here. But in either case, let's talk about uh, 
F1 watches, right? Yeah. And I mentioned earlier, uh, the first thing that honestly comes to mind is Hublot. Hublot. I can't oh. believe you just said that. If Nico was watching, I didn't say. I didn't say upset. first. I, <laughs> no, let me rephrase that. Not the first thing. One of the things that comes to mind is Hublot. Hublot made a lot of F1 watches. Good example here. Uh, Nick printed this. Uh, uh, Nick put this one up. Uh, Hublot Ferrari Unico Carbon Chronograph. When they came out with some of these watches, and, and there's no secret, I told you guys before, I'm a fan of Hublot. I think looks wise, price wise, I think this, this thing retailed, uh, uh, I think it retailed somewhere around the $27,000 yeah, price range when they came one. out. It's a good looking watch. Uh, I love the color scheme of it. I like the fact that it's black and red. It screams everything Ferrari, it screams definitely lots and lots of racing. So Hublot is, I'm going to say, pretty damn big when it comes to F1, because if you think of the different iterations of Hublot F1 watches, I'm sure Ian can put up a bunch of them on a screen. They were, to me, and are, to me, the more affordable F1 related watches. Outside of, if you, let's say, compare it to, obviously, Richard Mille and Audemars Piguet. Would you yeah. agree? And looks wise, again, I know people love to hate on Hublot, but look at, look at this Unico. Is this not a good looking watch? I would say this, and in no way, shape, or am I defending Hublot, but their Ferrari watches were my favorite line that they ever did. Yeah. Exactly, and this is one of those watches, and I think they did a wonderful job. Now, Schumacher, yeah, Audemars Piguet, the famous tri the famous trio. That was the trio to me that brought back. If you remember, uh, you know when uh, Barrichello's won the my, uh, the Montoyas, the other trios like the Grand Prix watches, yep. right? All obviously F one, all F one yeah. related. Uh, Team Alinghi, which is not F one related, but nevertheless, I'm just strictly talking about the trio, which was usually titanium, rose gold, and platinum, right? Uh, when the trios and the limited editions kind of died down, I think the Schumacher was the one watch, the one trio that sort of revived that hype again. Like people started looking because the Montoya's kind of died down, the Barrichello's, the Tima Lingis, all that stuff kind of died down. People went looking into Royal Oaks more, right? Which, funny enough, when the limited edition, when these things were hot, Royal Oaks were dead in the water. You can give away a Royal yeah, Oaks. So you know, it's insane. Uh, so with that said, you uh, had Michael Schumacher, and I believe that trio sort of revived that limited edition AP line, as far as I'm concerned. Again, you weren't around the times when these things were super hot. I, I mean, you weren't around, it was just little Yeah, small. this was like, I was coming into the business when these things already were kind of simmering down. Exactly. Bit. Although, I forget who it was, I think it was, maybe it was you, somebody had a Rose Montoya on, I was like, that's the one, that's the one. That's the thing, that, that was, that's always my argument within myself, if I had to pick between these two. This has been, uh, uh, an argument inside my head over and over and I always come down to the fact that I would probably go with the Barrichello and Titanium and Montoya and Rose like that was I wasn't a fan of the Barrichello and okay, Rose well, white I, will, I will give you my favorite in terms of from, from the AP line because there's other brands there's other drivers and watches that are much more favorable for me the Yarno Truly AP that is a good looking watch that is the best looking limited edition AP in my in my opinion offshore in my opinion the color scheme with the grays and the reds and the blacks Sick watch. I would argue that and come back to you with the F1 Singapore Grand Prix, the black and the red. Oh, man, they have so they got Singapore Grand Prix. They have. I mean, they have a combination of carbon, red yeah. dial, it, it's the strap, the red stitching. I mean, I think that pretty much every, uh, I think pretty much every AP, when they went into F1, be it a driver, be it an event or whatever it might be, you know, you had the Tour Autos, you had multiple, yeah, yeah. you had so many different watches out there. But what I loved about the Montoya specifically is the thought process that went into it. And a lot of people don't pay attention to, to detail on these things. If you look at the Montoya, everything about that watch, it actually represents something. The carbon is the carbon used, yep, right? Yep. Uh, the strap, this stitching, a lot of people mistake it for the stitching on the seats. It's not, it's actually the stitching on the suit that they wear. Oh, okay. okay? I didn't know that. If you look at the rotor, what does that remind you of? I mean, the brake calipers, right? If you look at the pushers, it's pedals, right? So there's so many things. There are so many things. Even even the crown, right, uh, is reminiscent of a car part. So there are so many things and so much thought that went into making of this particular watch. And I do believe they consulted with the drivers themselves as they were doing this. There's just so many, so much thought process that went into each one of them. And you know those things tend to get lost in translations. People will look at them as hype limited edition watches. They yeah. love them. Uh, a lot of people didn't stop for a second just to really look at these watches in detail and how much of the watch itself actually represents car racing, which which is what I found fascinating the most. And, and I will give kudos to Hublot just the same. If you look at a lot of their pieces, a lot of the parts, a lot of the watches, the design behind it is very, very reminiscent of car racing in general or cars. 
right? Which I thought was pretty cool. But speaking of Schumacher, Schumacher jumped to Audemars, right? Did you know who he was an ambassador for first? I do. Who? Tag Heuer. Wrong. Omega. Omega. Right. Thank you. Uh, and so you had the, uh, what do you call it? You had the Omega Schumacher. We can throw that one up on the screen. And here's the thing. And this is, I, this is, I guess, a question for you. Audemars Piguet. Yeah. And I go back. I mean, I think this uh, Omega was made. I know they made. I know they made uh, six thousand of them. I don't remember when they made them. I uh, actually no. This watch was made to celebrate the sixth World Championship win in Japan in two thousand three. So we're going back about fifteen years, right? Popularity of AP in two thousand three versus today is night and day. But Omega has always been that even key, most recognizable brand, right? Much like Rolex, right? Omega and Rolex were more or less synonymous. Would you? Wouldn't you agree? In yeah. terms of everybody knowing about yeah. them. So back in 2003, uh, I think that he was better off with Omega. I think he, he got a much bigger explosion with Omega versus Probably. that of Audemars Piguet. Wouldn't you agree? I Safe to say, yeah. And I think yeah. it was a smart move on Audemars Piguet part to try to get these ambassadors. From, from an ambassador perspective, an Ome Omega ambassador is a bigger ambassador than that of, let's say, Audemars Piguet. I would rather be an Omega ambassador than an Audemars Piguet ambassador. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know if... Uh, uh, Schumacher's jump was a jump up or a jump down, yeah, or maybe because his contract ended with Omega or something yeah. like that. I don't know. I don't know what that was all about. Uh, so we obviously mentioned the Montoya, right? Thousand in titanium, four fifty in rose gold, and ninety in platinum. Let me ask you a question: How many Montoyas would you say you sold over the years? Oh, I mean, I I've Look, talked, I I've came, I've talked I came, about this so many I came, times. I, I came I came into I came into luxury bazaar. Let's say. Legitimately, like around 2012 is like when I started okay. hitting the ground running. But before that, you know, we knew each other years before that. You were friends with my father. You were in the community, and I was in the watch before that. And like, Roman Shar's face was for me <laughs> synonymous with a, with the Montoya. I don't know why. So this is what like, we talked in the past about setting creating a market, right? Yeah. Which you know you would think it takes millions of dollars and so on and so forth. I created a market of these things, what I didn't have. What well, my company was was nowhere near my wallet was nowhere near the size it is today. Even though wallet is a real world was broke regardless. But, <laughs> but a long story short, the company wasn't that size. I noticed something there with specifically with Audemars Piguet. And oddly enough, it didn't start with an offshore. It started with the city of sales. And I realized that look, you here you have a limited amount of product. It's a good looking watch. We're in the market where bigger watches were starting to just take hold, so to speak. Before nobody cared for these clunkers, right? You can give away an offshore on a bracelet yeah. for four, five, six thousand dollars. And finally, once I saw the market shift towards bigger watches, I asked myself, "Listen, the company's history is there. I mean, Gerald Genta. I, mean, I don't have to go far, right? Uh, a company that started with, you know, they didn't. Automar Piguet didn't start with making, a, you know, a, a simple pocket watch or a simple wristwatch. Automar Piguet started making the most complex moments for Tiffany and Company watches, minute repeaters." Uh, you know, quarter repeaters, perpetual calendars, all those things. That's where they started. The Hurges was there, privately owned company, continuous running for, for a lot of years. I said, why not create this market? So how do you create a market? You stop buying this stuff, right? And the more you buy, the prices go up. You're literally raising your own prices. Yeah. But at the same token, you're selling the watch higher. The very first Montoya I sold, this thing came out of the gate at a retail of 14.7. And in a matter of like six months, they changed Titanium. it. Yes. They changed it to 17.9 because they realized that they priced it too low. And they realized that the market wanted them. I sold the very first one for... 14.5. I actually got it at a discount. Then when the retail jump up, they went to 17, 18. And I didn't, they didn't, I didn't take them from 17 to 25. They went gradually in probably two to three thousand dollar increments. They gradually went up until they hit a ceiling of high 30s. You know, I think the highest amount of toys ever sold, brand new, complete with all the bells and whistles, was around forty thousand dollars. We're talking titanium. Titanium. Now the rose gold. Now the rose gold went all. I mean, mind you, this is a watch that came out of the gate retail like a forty-two thousand. Yeah. You know, the retails back then weren't they what they are today? What's a uh, What's a new offshore rose gold retail for today? Offshore rose gold, let's say with ceramic, forty-four millimeter, um, forty-five ninths was frank. So damn near fifty thousand. Exactly. This thing came out of the gate at forty-two thousand as a limited edition. Yeah. And that watch, oddly enough, I couldn't afford to buy a bunch of rose Montoya's. But when the price of the titanium went up, so did the rose, and the rose went all the way up to eighty-five thousand. It stayed there for a long time, right? Yep. Again, it was the crisis that put all these things under. All these things up, to, up until the crisis. The Grand Prix rose gold. Platinum was 135. Yeah, that's correct. 125, 135. Rose gold, 85, 90, right? Uh, Barrichello traded for more because when the Barrichello came out, that was the, the follow up to the Montoya. But at that point, 
guess what? AP caught on to the game. They're like, oh, wait a minute. These things are trading through the roof on the market. We're going to retail these higher. So the Montoya, the Barrichello Titanium came out of 28.2 or 28.8. That was the retail. Barrichello 1, actually, if you want to talk about sleepers. Yeah, Barrichello sleeper. 1 is sleeper. a watch you couldn't give away. It was basically a rubber clad with a colorful what a cool, dial. What a cool dial, though. It, it, with, a, with a colorful dial. It didn't come in a special box. Mm -hmm. It was just like there was nothing really crazy about that watch. But again, as these things started going up. Which one came out first, Buddy Keller or Montoya? Montoya. Montoya first. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, you had other sleepers throughout that time, which had nothing to do with racing, like they had the base that went through the roof to yeah. a watch that originally retailed for 11000 and went to 65000 So where I was going with this is that creating that market was basically my pleasure. And I was pretty much known for limited edition offers, but I made a, a conscious choice and I realized that, look, creating this market is great, but I found myself putting my eggs in one basket. I had a lot of limited edition offers. I didn't give time. You could walk into a safe. You can see 50 different limited editions APs. And uh, I took note of my buddy OJ down in Florida, who what, formerly watching one, right? He was doing the same thing with Panerize, and he was doing well. And he and then I realized, I, and again, mind you, at the time we started, we were on eBay. It's not like our own websites went through the roof, and we were very dependent on eBay. And I looked at my safe one time. I said, listen, if I don't start diversifying now, eventually I will die because nothing lasts forever. Things can happen, and I can't have all eggs in one basket. And I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I managed to diversify. I was still... My specialty was still AP, but I diversified to everything else in the market simply because I knew that if something happens, I'm, my business is done if that's all I'm doing, right? Yep. And how much, how many more limited edition APs can they spit out that are going to trade at such a value that where I can make a good living on it? And you, you remember, anything hot, the margins suck, right? Because towards the end, I wasn't making anything on these yeah. things in terms of margin. You're just catching on the way up constantly. constantly so so constantly. Montoya is the one that started it for me, and I'm proud to say not to boast or show off. I was the guy that created the market on the limited edition option. A lot of guys follow suit, which is perfectly normal, which helped my cause. Uh, IWC, right? Uh, we got the Engineer Chronograph tribute to Nika Rosberg. Very clean watch. Very clean watch mm -hmm. in rose gold. Uh, to me, unfortunately, it doesn't scream F1. Yeah, IWC is not. It's, it's like it's, I see, I see, I see Lewis Hamilton, the greatest of all time, and he's sponsored by IWC. Yeah. Mercedes AMG, IWC, he's, he's sponsored. And like when he walks out, all the guy, like all the guys on the show, everyone's got a Richard Mille on. Yeah. Everyone. And he and, walks out on IWC. It's like nice. It just doesn't go with it. You it's know? not even that. It's like I feel like IWC missed the mark on what we talked about earlier. This is the actual design of the watch, yeah. right? It, when I look at this piece, it, to me, it does it's like if, if you look at that from before. I'm sorry, to me, that doesn't scream. It doesn't scream F1. It doesn't At scream all. car. It doesn't scream anything for me. Now, the next one... It which screams would, like getting driven in next, a Rolls Royce or something, you know? Maybe. <laughs> the next one, which is the one I just mentioned, yeah. the Grand Prix, right? They, they had it in carbon. They had it in uh, uh, rose gold. And they had it in platinum. The platinum one was my absolute one of my absolute favorite at limited APs for a while. That striking electric blue dial with the red. I mean, look at the sub-dials. Look at everything about this watch. It screams racing for you, right? The carbon, although was a bit of a flop on the bezel. Still is. It still is. I mean, uh, later AP, you would send the watch in that would take the carbon bezel and give you the ceramic, ceramic bezel yep. because once you ding that bezel, you're screwed. You can't polish it, you can't fix it, you can't do anything with it. So it was a bit of a flop. Uh, again, a watch that uh, sold for in a high market for up to $125,000. You, because out of all the limited editions, it's, it's unfair to rank or compare the trios, right, by metal. But if you took them all overall and you line them up on a table, people would reach for that platinum grand P just because of how striking that dial was. It was striking. You know? Just incredibly. And not only that, Grand Prix, Barrichello, Montoya, and even the Schumacher. How unwearable are those watches in platinum? Now, here's, it is pretty ridiculous. All right, let's see. Yeah, they're heavy. And here's the ridiculous. issue. And let's see if I, can, if I can show you this, guys. I have a permanent scar here. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. <laughs> and I'll tell you where this is from. This crown is super sharp so when you have a slightly smaller wrist what happens is when you put this watch on and you start doing this right this is where it imprints literally on top of your wrist to a point where you get a calluses right here and I've wore APs for a long time in a lot of these limited editions you put on a platinum version of this which is heavy as all hell yeah. that dent on your wrist is absolutely <laughs> insane and on the platinum ones either one of them now they kind of fix that with the Barrichello a little bit, where they sort of smoothed out this crown, it's more rounded, it's not as sharp as the other one, but this still will leave an indent on top of your wrist, unless you put it on really, really tight and wear it high. That was one of the complaints that a lot of people had And then had Schumacher about kind of gradually... Oh, Schumacher kind of gradually fixed yeah. all that. Speaking on the wrist, what are you wearing? 
15202, stainless steel. And I decided to put on the Rolex, rose gold, Daytona. Speaking of racing. Racing. Uh, thoughts on it? On which? I know what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, say it. So the watch is, has really made a remarkable comeback, I have to say. I mean, where it, it went been. from a market price of like 27 went from to like 47. 25 to freaking 57. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's unbelievable. But uh, shout out to all my ladies out there. As soon as a woman puts I'll on a watch, them. wears it on a daily, it's mm -hmm. forever a lady's watch for me. So forever. This is this is a little. It's not fair a hundred entirely, it's and I'll tell you why. I am, man. What I it is is that you know, in a Russian community, the you know, it's, which is not that small here in Philadelphia or New York for that matter. There's like two million of us in New York, right, and almost <laughs> yeah. almost a million here. Uh, you know, we're like a herd, and at one time somewhere. A girl put on this watch and said, you know what, this is going to be a cool girl's that watch. Size, yeah. And a lot of girls follow suit and he just, he can't get that image out of his head. Same thing, same thing happened with Day Day 2s. Mm -hmm. And just forever killed the watch for me. My wife wears a Day Day present. I can never own a Day Day present. And the same metal, because white gold is a little different. And platinum. What about platinum? Somebody killed that for me too. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Alex's wife. <laughs> uh, so look, we're, there's numerous brands out there that, that have done this. And it's not necessarily the high-end brands. Graham. Graham, uh, uh, Graham uh, did a lot of F1 watches. I think my I think my favorite one is the Super Light Carbon. I mean, this thing is. I've had this watch. I put this watch on for this humongous 47 millimeter size. It's extremely, extremely light. And again, took note to the design. The carbon, carbon. Historically, if you think carbon, you think car racing, right? Because carbon. 100. For guys that are into cars, carbon will synonymously go with car racing. Now, in guys that are into something else, carbon may represent something else. But for majority of guys out there, the minute you say carbon, it's you, you're thinking racing, you're thinking cars, right? You're thinking carbon finishes, you're thinking light material, right? Made for racing. Another one from IWC, the Lewis Hamilton. Now, the colors are there; they're representing really I, cool color. I like cannot that. unsee a big pilot. It is. I can. It's I a, wish. A I wish IWC. Just made something completely different. Look, they had the engineer line, which was sort of uh, related to that, you know, the Mercedes engineers and things of that nature. But I wish they wouldn't take an existing line, and I would just simply hope that they would just make me a car watch. Yeah. Just look, you got Lewis Hamilton, arguably one of the best out there, and the best. Well, again, yeah. I'm not into F1s. I know I know well yeah. enough to know that he's up there, right? But at the end of the day, you have. The most kick-ass ambassador. So make a watch for him. Don't take a. I cannot unsee a big pilot here. I just, I just can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, uh, I ne agree. Next one was your favorite, which was the Yarner Truly. Yeah. Right. Now, well, my, it's not my favorite. One of F1 your favorite. inspired okay. watch. Uh, one of the thing, one of the things I liked about Yarner Truly is again the color scheme. It's the those grays with the blacks with the carbon. Uh, uh, right. It's uh, you know the case is carbon, but the but the bezel is not, so it's practical. The subtle hints of red. The way the chronograph is displayed, and if you, in reality, if you think about it, chronograph screams sports, laps, timing laps, yeah. and things like that. So by nature, pretty much any chronograph by nature is going to scream some sort of racing. Now, yeah. it's related to horse racing, but for the most part, listen, Daytona. Yep. Right? You think chronograph, you will probably nine out of times think racing. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna agree with you on the Yarno Truly. One I mean, of the Yarno, things- Yarno, yeah, Sorry to cut you off. Yarno Truly is just one of those examples as to my favorite line of offshores, car 42 black carbon offshores and why they, what do you think is manufacturing issues? Why they did away with them? No, they're I think, still, I, I they're think still, that, I think they just moved. They're still good they moved, sellers. They moved, they moved with the time that they came out with new things. I think now ceramic is a big deal. Car, car, they, they just, they just, look at Richard Mille, NTPT and every other watch right now. NTPT is not carbon. It's different. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a completely it's, different, it's, it's, a compl it's, 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 but it's, it's a completely different technology. It's thin ply. It's thin. Was it North Thin Ply Technologies of the company, and it's it's literally it's the technology behind it, how it's layered and everything else. It's 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 completely different. I think it's more durable in the carbon used in APs, first of all. Maybe. And uh, again, different things. Again, obviously they put a different spin on it because they couldn't just call it carbon. In reality, yes, I guess it is a carbon, right? Yes. But the uh, carbon-like material. Let's just call it plastic, right? For that, <laughs> for listen. It how is, dare it, you? <laughs> right. That's 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 the most common thing that haters say about Richard Mille. All those plastic watches that sell for five hundred thousand dollars. Speaking of plastic watches that sell for five hundred thousand, I'm gonna let you run off with this. Start spitting Richard Mills at me for F1. Oh man, where is? I mean, look, the the, the gold standard of Richard Mille watches is Felipe Massa. Started with the RM5, 
went to the RM11, and then there's just... How many like, pieces did they make in an RM5? RM5? Well, they had the Platinum... No, I'm sorry. They had a... They had a... Uh, we had a Platinum one, RM5 Platinum Masa, and they had... What's the other one called? What was it? It was Titanium, but it was Sandblasted. Sandblasted, that's exactly, right. Exactly, which was... Yeah. Now, we're going back to a time where, again, he wasn't around, and I sold those watches, and let me tell you how many issues I've had with the Titanium Felipe Masa. Now, mind you, back then, I sold them for like 25, 30,000, right? But <laughs> I wish I could bring those. <laughs> the strap that they made with the watch was a complete BS, because what they did is they imitated the finish of the watch. They imitated onto the strap, and the minute you start bending that strap, that stuff would crack, and, it, and my, my clients would drive me nuts. You know those satin straps that yes. come on Cartier's that always crack, and yes, it's like yes, it's just... Yes. It was the same type of concept. It was the worst thing that they yeah, actually... Yeah, but nobody keeps them on those straps anymore. They made uh, new straps. Uh, obviously, they did. Like also, the finish on the Zero 05 was terrible because the minute it would scratch easily and you couldn't do anything about it's it. still one of the it. nice sandblasted finishes. Or still but it was nice not the sandblast finish you have today. today yeah. I don't know yeah. what they did back then and how they baked it on or whatever yeah. it is they did. It was not good. And, it, and I had nothing but trouble with the titanium. The platinum, which they made 50 of, much easier. You could work with platinum. You could polish yeah. it. But back then... You didn't really have a whole lot of guys that could even take care of them. They were so new. It was just like, yeah. you know, those, you know, you, I could never get it done right. It took a while for somebody to actually get used to actually fixing them with yeah. those watches and polishing them up. What's up, bro? What's up, brother? You are on Watches and Whiskey. Congratulations. Ooh. All right, so... Should I go pull out a whiskey at 1 p.m.? I, I, had a quick, I had a quick question for you, right? So, we were going through F1 watches, right? We were going through racing watches. Now, you ran Graham North America how long? So let me let me ask you let me ask you real quick, and this is just I mean it's a good question that the audience may have because nobody really knows the insides and out. When it came to your F1 watches, right? For example, we were we were specifically looking at the which one was this the the Carbo um, where is it Carbo Tech uh, the, the Carbo oh, Tech no, watches uh, and the, not a kind of Spanerai, the <laughs> the super light carbon watch, right? Uh, so whenever you were making F1 watches, is this something that you got? You have to guys pay royalties for to use uh, to make the F1 theme watches. Well, so we were lucky in the sense of we had uh, formed a partnership at that time with um, who was it? Uh, Braun Racing, mm -hmm. and they had that year won the Formula One, and they oh. were acquired by the Mercedes GP Petronas team. So because of our contract, we were grandfathered in to the Mercedes GP Petronas team, and we were able to make watches with their logo, and there were no additional royalties paid. Okay. And, and uh, because a lot of times, we, you know, we look at uh, a lot of these companies that go out there, they get their sponsorship, like GP, for example, they had Ferrari and, and some of these other companies. I feel like they, have to, they pay so many royalties, they have to spit out so many watches in order to pay for it. It sort of lost its appeal. Graham, yeah, Graham, the purpose. yeah, but with Graham, you managed to keep the numbers pretty low. Like this guy was limited to five hundred. I remember buying editions that were two fifty, fifty, and so on and so forth. Overall, yeah. you know, as a guy that ran this brand for quite a few years, uh, do you think uh, did it? How much did it help the brand overall? And how big is that up one audience? You know, if, if I'm speaking very frankly, it absolutely helped the brand just because, from a global perspective, Mercedes Mercedes GP Petronas is an amazing brand and. They had Schumacher under their racing team, and they had Rosberg under their racing team. Um, was it a great strategic move? Absolutely. Was it a move for a company like ours that uh, was a little bit difficult to swallow just because of what we did have to pay? Sure. So if I look back at it, it was a great move, but it did hurt the bank for a smaller brand like ours. Yeah, because it, it just costs you way too much. Uh, yeah, and then, and, and then what happens is, is all of our eggs are in pretty much a few baskets uh, for marketing. For that given year. And you can't, you couldn't really do anything else besides that because your your marketing budget was basically blown. Uh, yeah. I'll I'll ask you one last question. By the way, guys, you're gonna see Samir back. because Samir now runs a different company, which I won't mention the name because it's going to be a surprise. He's gonna join us in the studio in a little bit to show us really kick-ass yeah, product. But last question for you: that. What are your thoughts of F1 coming to Miami? I think it's amazing. Uh, I, was I know I know you're car, I know you're an F1 guy, so I know you're excited. I'm very excited. I'm very excited with a few of the brands that we run. There's there could be good synergies, but once again, you know what this stuff is gonna cost. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, get, it does get exciting. I mean, look, I know that getting luxury bazaar on top of one of those cars is not something <laughs> I'm gonna be able to afford anytime soon. Hopefully, maybe one day. I don't know if you remember what, you, what we got on the cars, the, the, the rear view mirrors. We just had Graham on that. <laughs> 
I remember that they literally gave him a little spot oh, on really? the rear rear mirror. Like it's like you can't even see it. Like like Samir literally said, "You see, we're right there." I'm like, "Where? They're right there. Look, look, look closer. We're right hey, there." Hey, but with respect, you know they made the replica cars, and at least it was on the replica as well. True. Speaking right. of replica, <laughs> speaking speaking of which, look at this guy. This is this is the oh, one that came with the nice. this is the one that came with the Lotus Richard Mule. Yeah, I, I this. that's beautiful. Anyway, Samir, I appreciate you picking up. Thanks for your input. Uh, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see you in a little bit. We, we're still. We still have a video to do, brother. All right. I'll see you later. Bye. Right. See you, man. Well, he called back. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so back to Richard Meal. So Richard Meal, your favorite. Yeah, man. What? Favorite Richard Meal? Within the realm of racing. Oh, the Kimi Raikkonen. Yeah. 5004. It's just engineering. Uh, there's no, there's no term to describe the engineering behind that watch, and the fact that it's white and red, like white NTPT case with everything going on, and impossible to get. What's the market price? What's the, re what was the retail on it? <sighs> Let me the time. Question you up. Low ones, one two, one three, maybe retail, and today it's two and a half million, maybe if you could get it. It's just one of those things where it costs as much as the next person as somebody that hasn't I mean, we, we've gotten to a point where these things are costing more than you know some of the hottest supercars out there it's insane you can you can just spit out any price if somebody has a kimmy today they can ask three million for it if they want speaking of kimmy this thing can survive did you know that it can survive uh five g forces five g's yeah yeah that's actually is it five or five thousand <laughs> i'll never ever ever forget and actually it came exactly with this car another richard mule issue <laughs> oh yeah, to tell. It was the McLaren Turb NTPT with the rose gold size, so it was a real, real one. Not that they, not that the all carbon one isn't, but the rose gold size. Right. That's the one. Bought the watch from from somebody. Sold it to a good friend of mine in Indonesia. Watch was delivered to our Hong Kong office. My uh, the guy from Indonesia's brother went to go pick it up. Everything's good. I get a phone call in the morning. It's always the morning. Because yeah, I know. They always get you in the morning. It's always, it's always the morning. That's why, that's why I got you an April Fool's early in the morning. Because that's when you get all your news. It's always, always in the morning. He calls me. He goes, bro, we got an issue. I'm like, what happened? The G sensor isn't working. I'm like, the what? The G sensor. So there's an indicator in the dial. That shows the G forces that the watch is taking. Which, on. which we never, which I never tested because I didn't even know how to test it. But apparently, you literally had. So this was a million dollar watch, so you had to go like this. You know, I didn't want to do that with a million dollar watch. <laughs> Yo, ass would drop that. You know what I'm saying? You literally have to go like that to measure the G force, and the indicator and the marker moves. I didn't know how to do that, so I just kind of assumed it was working, and then the deal got crushed from there. It was a whole process to fix that thing. I remember. I, I know you, you have to go back to Richard Mille. Yeah, I had service the whole thing because that was that was nobody nobody wanted to work on that. Only yeah. Richard Mille can work on that. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to give that to anybody to work on. But, but literally, I saw a video of him doing it with his previous one, and he took the watch and went like this. Well, him. it goes back to a conversation I had earlier with our new salesperson Alex. I told him I said, you know, I came in and I asked him uh, something. Uh, oh, with the fifty two oh seven that we're getting right, uh, the mini repeater term. Mm -hmm. So he, I go to him. I'm like, what's a fifty two oh seven? goes and goes it's like it's an annual perpetual calendar <laughs> so <laughs> long story short listen i don't blame him the kid just started you know? it's not wrong you know <laughs> he is there's no it's either an annual calendar or a perpetual calendar it's one or the other so oh, he's, he's the, you know and i told him I, one thing i told him i said look i'll give you a little advice i said don't wing stuff don't make stuff up if you're selling a watch and it's a watch it's just slightly complicated or not so complicated regardless of what it is do you, you just sold the watch Go to Wikipedia, go to wherever sources you can, come to me, ask me, hey, what does this watch actually do? How does this watch actually work? And that's an advice that I, you could have used when you were selling that million. How much is how much was that at the time? 800. And today? 1.2. I'll take that back with the broken thing. Oh, <laughs> but here, here's the thing, is that a lot of people that I asked about it, because, you know, we, we a lot of us rich meal dealers in the industry, we like, we'll, we'll ask each other questions. So I asked... I remember like five guys at the time, like, yo, how did this G-Sense work? Like, no, no idea. Nobody had any idea besides my friend in Indonesia. Because he sold, he's like part of Ferrari Collectors Club. And like, I, te I tend to, look, I, it's it's rare it's rare that I come across certain watches that I don't know the inner workings yeah. of, how they work, or what the functionality is. Although, I must say, some of the newer stuff, especially from Independence, I, have to, I do have to do some reading, right? Uh, and uh, where just to figure out the functionality and because somebody's I mean somebody independent stuff comes in you're like 
Oh, we're getting we're getting like the MBNF uh, perpetual, by the way, the limited one they made to twenty five pieces. You're gonna look at that watch and be like, how? Exactly. Right. On a, on a so, G sensor, there, there there isn't a, a button. There's not a pusher. There's nothing. You exactly. Know, chronograph, you can see minute repeater. Right. I get it, but, but I still I still make it a point so many years later to learn about the watch that I'm selling. A if a client, potential client asks me a question, uh, it's not about sounding stupid, it's about not knowing, right? I'm not even afraid to sound stupid, I can admit to mistakes, but oftentimes I feel like a, any watch salesperson, anybody that deals with watches professionally should at least know. But I don't, like you said, I don't know if you would have went out and Googled that whole entire deal. I don't know if you would ever, ever would have found that information, yeah. which, is, which is pretty silly. Speaking of uh, racing watches, let's talk about Daytona specifically, green Daytona. It was yes. a little bit of a panic yes. on the market, and everybody kind of panicked a little bit, and the prices kind of started, you know, slipping down. But have they really slipped down? They were all on the way back up. They're on the way back up. They yeah. went up to 80, 85. So, again, green Daytona, hyped up because of John Mayer, because of the dial. Yes, less pro less production, everything. But, but then, saw, but then, but then, it went to the next level when all yeah. the other roles started here's, going here, up. Here, here's something very, very interesting that I pointed out, and I knew this was going to happen. So, because of the lack of supply that Rolex uh, supplies, for lack of a better term, of Green Daytona, what happened was in those two weeks after the speculation died off, they did not become discontinued. You saw a price drop. You saw people starting to dump merchandise, you know, and then you know what happened? There wasn't anything on the market. There was a legitimate shortage of it. And what you know, did we do? We bought five. Yeah, and we made out. <laughs> and we made out well. And I said, exactly. I said, there's no need to panic. I'm telling you, they're going to dry up, and they dried up. I talked about this before. You have lots of those flippers out there. You have lots of guys that have gotten to this business for a quick buck. And uh, you know, when the Amex bill is due at the end of the month, and you, have to, and, and you pay through the roof for this, you know, you paid seventy five thousand for Green Daytona wholesale, trying to sell it for seventy eight eighty, and all of a sudden you see, oh my God, this thing is dropping. Let me get rid of it before it goes down to fifty, which it obviously did not. Uh, with that said, it's a hell of a business for some of these kids. I gotta say, they run around, they hit the black Amex card, they have zero overhead, they have their inventory that they paid on the black Amex card, and they flip it out but before they have to pay the bill. Cost them zero, and they accrue just shitload of points by doing it. Hey, listen, that stuff doesn't last forever. I've seen, what? I've seen, Wild. I've seen, I've seen this happen. I've seen this, I've seen this before, where the retail market turns dealer to guys like us. We're just here to pick all that stuff up, deliver the watches as we deliver them. But at the end of the day. When the dust settles, we're still going to be here, and a majority of those guys are going to be gone, which, uh, you know, it's a, it's a topic of conversation that I've talked about numerous times, uh, buying, it, who do you buy from, right? You know, do you buy from a guy that flips an $80,000 watch to make $1,000? Do you buy from that same guy that wants to make three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, a normal profit margin, but stands behind the product, and there's a company to go back to, and three years later, if something happens with your watch, we're still here to fix it, and things of that nature. But again... Uh, for some, and I don't knock those that are out there hunting for these super deals. And you know, in the big scheme of things, if you buy an eighty-five thousand dollar watch, I don't think a difference of eighty-one thousand versus eighty-four thousand should make that difference money-wise. But oftentimes, people don't take the time to weigh out. Hey, what am I paying three extra thousand dollars for? Exactly. They only see that. Oh, wait a minute, he's three thousand dollars cheaper. Yeah. All right. Well, he's a guy you found on Instagram that, like you said, is out there flipping the stuff. And if uh, that watch comes in, and you know, watches do come in defective from the factory, right? Uh, and you pay that kid eighty-one thousand dollars, and you come back to him six months down the line and say, "Hey, there's something is wrong." He'll tell you, "Well, go to Rolex, right?" And I'll tell you, "Here's a label. Ship the watch back in. We'll take care of it." So, anyway, that's a, that's a different side point. Platinum Daytona's, however, stopped, but didn't really go down. We just sold one yesterday for one fifteen. Yep. Uh, so a brand new on the pre-owned market. There's still over a hundred. Speaking of which, I need one pre-owned. Um, this is the story of our business. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, so no Green Daytona scare. No, no Green Daytona scare. Uh, right now, you may still be able to buy it a bit cheaper than they say they were a month yeah. ago. Yeah. Which uh, would you suggest that you do? Somebody does that. It's so hard to say. It's so hard to gauge what's going to happen in the future. Let, let's just let's just assume all things will remain the way they are. I would say buy it now. Because eventually, because there is a lot of speculation, again, that it will become discontinued, and eventually it will be. And I think it's a great collection. What do you think is discontinued piece. faster, the, the Green Daytona or the Platinum Daytona? I would have to say the Pl Platinum's been out for how many years already? Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that's probably due for either a discontinuation or some type of ch change or reiteration or something. Facelift. Not facelift, but color. Something. I don't know. You know. Give me a couple of standout buys in the last week. 
that you bought. Standout buys. I mean, you guys have been watching my Instagram story. Adrian is just, I think Adrian <laughs> bought up all of Rolexes in North America. <laughs> there is legit shortage now, man. We have, past two weeks has been like slow. Yeah, the Instagram been, stories have gotten smaller. Slow. They're just. Give me a good standout buy. Well, I thought today was a standout buy with the 5270P. <laughs> oh, I told but him, with Adrian, I was, as I, usual, there's always no, something. No, 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 no. This, this, was, this was legitimate. A guy sends me a message like three weeks ago for uh, no box, no papers, 5270P, salmon. Everybody knows I like. Your favorite watch. And he wanted a certain price for it. I said, no, no, thank you. It's not for me. We're too far. Two weeks later, he sends me, bro, how about a 2020 5270P? What can you offer? So I made him an offer, made the deal go through. He connected me with the, he, he's kind of like a broker kind of deal. Okay. Connected me with the buyer. I'm sure he was getting some type of fee. And uh, as pictures were coming in, because they, they wanted me to send 50% deposit, and 50% when it comes in. And the guy is legitimate. I know the broker, the guy who connected us. And sends me a picture of the watch. I'm like, well, where are the box and papers? No box and papers, no exhibition, no uh, extra case back or anything. So. That didn't help. Meanwhile, that this, been a good this, buy, this, this, meanwhile, this morning, Adrian walks in. He's like, I made a great buy <laughs> last night or whatever it was. I'm like, yeah, tell me. Tell me about that. I'm like, it's great. Three hours later, Adrian's like, no great buy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the standouts I think the standouts are oh, man, definitely... I, think. I think last week, the standouts for me was the Zeitwick Minute Repeater. Uh, that Turbion Perpetual as well, both in Platinum. Specifically, the Zeitwick Minute Repeater. It's funny. I just talked about... We just talked about Longies. I said that was like the FU piece kind of thing. So that came in. I, I really like that buy just the same. Uh, that would probably be it for me for the week. And 6702 Black, from your boy, Sam. <laughs> Don't I go back to that story. I think, I think, I think we'll, we'll mold that story over and over at this point. But uh, in either case, uh, if you were to pick a car, an F1-related watch, which brand outside of those that are already there do you think is a good fit for F1 watches? None of the brands we mentioned? None of the brands that we mentioned. Who would you like to see do? I would say Rolex, but that's just a boring answer because they're not going to do anything. They're not going to make like an F1 Daytona. You know, they're not going to... Agreed. Although um, it would be the logical choice. Yeah. Uh, oh, I have one in my mind, but I'll give you a hint. They make machines. You gonna say MBNF? Yeah, I was gonna say MBNF, but it's. Like I would go with an independent, an Erwerk, an MBNF, a DBU, some of these guys that make these crazy machines to begin with that are out of this world, so super futuristic. I think if you gave Max Buser the challenge of making the ultimate F1 watch, I think he would bring in so much talent. He brings uh, so yeah. He, he, he brings so much talent to the table. Some of yeah. the most talented watchmakers out there that collab together and do all these things together. I think MBNF would probably I make was gonna the say, ultimate one. I was one. legit going to say MBNF. They would make something absolutely. I sick. mean, look at their racing machines to begin with. They're already scream, you know, racing and so on and so forth. Although they're a little more futuristic. Or, or if Grubel came into it with a sporty watch, something on a strap, something in carbon, Grubel. Some type of like. But at least we agree that. that Ten axis at, le at, le at least we agree on independent. Yeah. But if anybody like Lange. Wait, hold on a second. We keep getting critiqued on how we say Lange. Longa. Longa. So if Longa, I think they're Odysseus. Uh, that was sort of their entrance not into the thing. sports market. Panic. I don't think it's. it's not I don't think. I don't think it's a sports watch. I think that. I think that if Lange were to make a completely new, brand new sports watch, it'd be a good kick-ass. It would be a kick-ass idea to come up with an F1 themed watch and make it actually a sporty watch, not like a hybrid of dressy. Because I don't think Odysseus is really that sporty. That's just. It's sportier because it has a rubber strap, but there's no way, shape, or form does long, 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 long <laughs> or paddock have anything to do with F1. Well, I'll Doesn't drink work. to that. I'll drink to F1 now. We got to look into, I think we we got to look into getting tickets there now. 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 Like, we're a year I'm and a half. Already, I, I've already inquired with a few people. I'm going to call Amex. Let's see what they say. Good luck. I would, I would, you have a better chance of calling um, where we get Mercedes from. Okay. Because like they give tickets like to the U.S. Open or any type of golf tournament, maybe they have some so they have allocation of tickets or something. Or maybe we could just call Lewis Hamilton. You got his number? Yeah. <laughs> got him on speed dial. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's Watches and Whiskey. I hope you enjoyed today's themed episode. I thought I thought it went well. There's so much more we can talk about when it comes to F1 watches. There's really hundreds upon hundreds of different ones out there from various brands. We just wanted to touch upon the topic. 
I I'm gonna try my best to see if we can make it to the opening event of that because a that would me make for hella content and uh, certainly would be a hell of an experience. And although I'm not a big F1 fan, but I'm sure I can become one if I yes. if I went there a lot. Yes, guys, thanks for tuning in once again. We'll see you next week.